What on earth did they expect? Labour went into an election with no vision, with no idea whatsoever of what the party stands for, with no idea whatsoever of who the party represents, with no way of allowing voters to answer the most basic fundamental question of all before they traipse to their local polling station, I would like to vote for the Labour Party because... And do you know what? Enough of the excuses. They are pathetic. The fact there are people blaming Jeremy Corbyn for this catastrophe over a year since he stopped being leader of the Labour Party, when he's not even in the Parliamentary Labour Party because he's been booted out, is pitiable. It's embarrassing. As Hartlepool's own local defeated candidate, Paul Williams, said, Jeremy Corbyn didn't come up on the doorstep. So I think we should put that to bed. These results were the result of the decisions taken by the Labour leadership. This is on them. The fact that they have reduced the Labour Party to a party which doesn't stand for anything. Fact. Less than four years ago, back in 2017, over half of Hartlepool's voters voted for the Labour Party. Yes, when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party. Fact. Even in 2019, which I think we can all agree was a catastrophe for the Labour Party, Labour still managed in Hartlepool to get a higher share of the vote than they got in 2015, and the Brexit Party got a lower share of the vote than UKIP got in 2015. If Labour could win over Leave voters in 2017 in Hartlepool, when Brexit was a massive dominant issue in British politics, then what on earth is Keir Starmer's excuse today? Fact. Oppositions are supposed to do better in a by-election than they would in a general election. And indeed, before this disaster, only twice in the last 50 years has an opposition party lost to a governing party, and not as badly as this. Now, Labour are currently going around telling people that the reason they haven't been able to set out a vision is because COVID-19 got in the way. What a load of desperate guff. In World War II, which I think we can all agree was a bigger national emergency, Labour were up against an extremely popular Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who you would think would have had the election on a plate, but he lost. Labour won on a landslide. Why? Because Labour looked at that national emergency and used it to set out their vision. They said that when Britain wins the war, we have to win the peace. And Labour is in the best position to define what that peace looks like by confronting the injustices exacerbated and highlighted by war and by not going back to what existed before. Labour could have done that with COVID-19 and they failed. They failed to pin responsibility for one of the worst handlings of COVID-19 on the face of the earth, which left 150,000 of our fellow citizens dead and economic ruin as a consequence. The fact that the Tories got away with locking down too late repeatedly, reopening without a functioning test and trace system because they handed it to their mates, and all the other disasters throughout the pandemic is scandalous, and that's on Labour. Because Labour didn't have a narrative of how the Tories got it so badly wrong and how they would have done it better, they have left people resigned to how the government have handled this pandemic. Which brings me to the 2017 election, which everyone wants to simply scrub out of existence as though it never happened. Labour didn't win in that election, of course. And we need to acknowledge that and ask ourselves why it wasn't enough. But at the same time, we should be asking why in 2017, an election which began with Theresa May with spectacular popularity, with the Tories 24 points ahead, why did Labour get the biggest vote surge since 1945? Why did they get their best share of the vote since 2001 when Tony Blair won in a landslide? Why did they put on seats for the first time since 1997? And why was it the closest the Labour Party got to government in over a decade? Now, there are people who go, oh, well, that's all because Theresa May was such a woeful, terrible candidate. Well, Theresa May, as I've said, was extraordinarily popular at the beginning of the 2017 election. And the reason it was such a disastrous campaign is because Labour's campaign was so good. The, the so-called dementia tax. To begin with, when Theresa May proposed that, it was lauded by the right-wing press. It was only when Labour and its allies defined it as the dementia tax did the Tory campaign begin to crumble. And Labour offered policies and ideas which were popular. Labour MPs at the time, many of whom were so hostile to Jamie Corbyn, they themselves accepted that the policies played a key role. And indeed, the post-election polling showed that only 7% of people who voted Labour did so because of Brexit, which is why Labour managed to get a surge of votes in Leave Heartlands, like Hartlepool or Peterborough, as well as Remain Fortresses, 
like Canterbury or Kensington. Of course we need to talk about what Jeremy Corbyn got wrong, not just what he was up against, which was a lot, but also the mistakes that were made, which helped ensure Labour didn't win in either 2017 or the rout in 2019. Of course we should have that conversation. We should also ask ourselves though, why was 2017 an election which booked a pretty gruesome trend and it was a vision, a vision that inspired people which can at least be built upon. Now, after this latest election route, the Labour right are on manoeuvres. And do you know what? They have nothing to say. They have no ideas. They have no policies. They have no vision. One of the reasons Jeremy Corbyn became a leader of the Labour Party back in 2015 was because they had nothing to say. And they had years of political exile to sit down and work out what they actually believed in, and they didn't. And as a consequence, many of them are now to the right of the Conservatives. The Tories have a vision, you might not like it, but it is a clear vision. They synthesised right-wing nationalist populism with strategic investment. They they aren't the Osborne, Cameron, cut, cut, cut Tories. They're the spend, spend, spend Tories. It's not being spent in the way that we on the left would like, but they are splashing the cash in ways that previous Conservatives didn't. And the Labour right are to the right of them. They're stuck in a pre-2015 time warp about fiscal responsibility. What on earth do they have to offer? And that's why we ended up with the grotesque chaos of a Labour opposition, a Labour opposition scuttling round its spokespeople to TV studios to oppose Rishi Sunak increasing corporation tax. If Labour don't come up with a vision, they're sunk, completely sunk. You only have to look across the channel to see Labour's European sister parties who are in an even worse state than the Labour party in this country. Labour needs a vision that's optimistic that makes people enthusiastically want to vote for the Labour Party rather than simply voting to keep the Tories out, or at least try to. Now, what they should have said in the pandemic, they should have said that we applauded the key workers, did we not, from our windows and our balconies and our porches. Key workers, millions of them, who've been undervalued and underpaid for so many years, and Labour is going to offer them a new settlement, the pay they deserve. They should be able to look down the barrel of a camera and promise that nurses, nurses who carried this nation through its worst national emergency since the Nazis were bombing these shores, they should get the pay rise they deserve and Labour couldn't even do that. That they should promise the self-employed and the precarious workers of this country the security they deserve, the lack of security which has been exposed by this pandemic. They should promise to deal with a housing crisis which is eating up the living standards and security of the young. They should say to young people who formed a, a cordon sanitaire around older people by giving up some of the best year months of their lives in order to protect older people, that they won't be saddled with debt for daring to dream for a university education from which all of society benefits. They should say to the millions of people who saw how scandalously low and inadequate universal credit is that they will build a new welfare state that is fit for the people of this country. They should say that as test and trace expose the shambolic nature of private sector delivery of government services that the NHS vaccine rollout showed something completely different, that the public sector works and that's why we should bring our utilities and services under the public ownership of the people of this country. And they should also say that the state being able to show that it can act if it has the willpower to deal with COVID-19 shows they should do the same with the climate emergency, with a green industrial revolution that will bring a new wave of secure, well-paid jobs to communities across the country which have been left bereft of them. They're not saying these things though, are they? They're saying nothing. They have nothing to say. That's why this is up to all of us. If the Labour leadership can't offer the inspiring alternative that the people of this country deserve, then they should reconsider their own positions, but it falls to the rest of us. They want to scapegoat and demonise anyone who has the audacity to believe that we do have the potential to build a new society free of the injustices that scar and define our own. We can't let them. We have to speak louder, be more determined and more courageous. That's a fight we can win. But if we don't, and we allow the Labour leadership to carry on on their present course, then the Labour Party is on the road to complete ruin. And we will end up going the way of a country like Hungary under the forever rule of a right-wing authoritarian populist government. If we want to stop that, we have to do something. And quick.